A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online Lecture 245, uh, Squint and Pediatric Ophthalmology Lecture 32. Today we have with us Dr. Renu Grover from Eye Care Hospital Noida, talking to us on non-surgical approaches to strabismus, when and how, uh, and about botulinum toxin. Uh, the chair for tonight is Dr. Pradeep Sharma, sir. I request him to welcome our speaker for tonight and uh, introduce her to our audience. Thank you, Dr. Shafali. It's a real pleasure uh, welcoming Dr. Renu Grover and introducing her. Uh, she's a really a young strabismus stalwart with us. And she has uh, had a great experience right from her MS from Institute of Thermology, Aligarh, JNMC, and then uh, going to Europe for the European Strabismus Association Fellow, ICO Pediatric Ophthalmology at Ludwig Maximilian University, Germany. Currently, she is a senior consultant in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at the eye care eye hospital and postgraduate institute noida uh, past consultant pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus with center for sight new delhi 2010 to 2015 and then st stephen's hospital new delhi from 2001 to 2010 local kalyan samiti new delhi 99 to 2001 she has special interest in complex strabismus pediatric cataract and amblyopia Today, she is going to talk about the non-surgical management of strabismus and uh, about botanum toxin. Uh, it is a vast subject, and she is going, uh, going to present us the uh, in a uh, manner which we is unique to her. And we are going to listen to her. So please, on to uh, Dr. Renu Grover. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you for having me here. Special thanks to you and Dr. Hanawa. It's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be uh, speaking in these uh, lecture series. So I'm going to be uh, talking about, basically I'm going to be talking about uh, botulinum toxin and strabismus. Uh, so uh, these are some of the non-surgical approaches to strabismus. I'm not going to go mu too much in detail, but uh, these are the basic. We cannot uh, start uh, treating strabismus without doing these uh, basic, uh, th a basic refraction in children. And it is very important. Uh, uh, a lot of, uh, as we tell the patients, uh, uh, eight out of 10 times, uh, the strabismus may be uh, corrected just by wearing glasses. So. Uh, uh, wearing glasses is a very important part, non-surgical part of uh, treating strabismus. As you can see in this child, anisotropia, and with the glasses, the child is getting corrected. And sometimes we may need to give bifocals as well. Uh, uh, the second uh, uh, important uh, non-surgical approach is uh, uh, wearing prisms. Uh, you can, these days we have these Fresnel prisms. Uh, they are these uh, stick-on prisms, which you can uh, stick onto the glasses. They uh, don't show up too much uh, from far. And uh, uh, these are basically used for uh, conditions in which uh, there, there's a small angle strabismus or there's an indication, there's not an indication for surgery. Uh, so you have these 3M uh, prisms, uh, which can be just pasted on the glasses and the patient the, the, the problem with this is that uh, with prisms, there's usually a one line drop uh, in vision and uh, all patients may not really adapt to prisms so well. And we have the orthoptic exercises. So we have uh, for various conditions, inversions, insufficiency, accommodative insufficiency. So uh, I'm not gonna go, go too much in detail, but yes, uh, they are helpful. Um, uh, in uh, children as well as adults. Uh, the drawback is in children, not uh, all children are unable to do the orthoptic exercises. It's difficult for them to follow instructions and do them. But uh, saying that uh, in certain specific conditions, their conversions insufficiency, they are very helpful in uh, myopes uh, who have undergone LASIK, uh, uh, the accommodative uh, facility is poor and accommodative exercises help a lot. Uh, so they do have a role, a big role in uh, uh, managing strabismus. So finally, I come to uh, botulinum toxin. Uh, I'm going to be talking in detail about uh, this. So uh, botulinum toxin is a neurotoxin produced by Clostridium botulinum. 
just going through a brief history that uh, German physician and poet uh, Kerner, he collected information on 230 cases of sausage poisoning. Uh, so botulism is, it comes from the word botulus, which is a Latin word for sausage. In 1897, bacterium Clostridium botulinum was identified. And in 1910, type B botulinum toxin was isolated and 1920, uh, uh, type A was isolated. So Dr. Alan uh, Scott, he's a, a big name in uh, botulinum toxin. He is the first one to uh, use it for the treatment of strabismus, uh, for initially on monkeys and then on humans. In 1981, the botulinum toxin uh, for treatment of uh, strabismus was started in humans. And in 1989, uh, finally, botulinum toxin A was approved by FDA and the National Institute for the treatment of strabismus. So it's basically botulinum toxin A, which is used for treatment of strabismus. What is the mechanism of action of uh, botulinum? So uh, the nerve endings have uh, these uh, synaptic vesicles which release acetylcholine, which goes and binds to the receptors on the muscle fiber. So the botox, uh, the bot sorry, botulinum toxin, it uh, inhibits these uh, the acetyl uh, the release of um, acetylcholine from the nerve endings and uh, uh, prevents the uh, contracture of the muscle fiber. So this is the, uh, uh, this is, uh, the uh, botulinum toxin, which has a heavy chain and a light chain. So there are these uh, protein, uh, uh, proteins, the uh, SNAP25 and syna uh, syntaxin and uh, synaptobrevin. These, um, uh, the, sorry, keeps jumping. So these, uh, these protein molecules, they uh, go into the synaptic vesicles and uh, help in the release of acetylcholine, which then binds to the muscles and then the muscle cell contracts. So the botulinum uh, toxin A, the light chain of botulinum toxin A cleaves the light, uh, the SNAP25, the, the protein, uh, which is uh, helping the acetylcholine to be released. It cleaves it and it prevents the acetylcholine to be released and the, there is no contraction of the muscle cell. So the paralysis of the injected extraocular muscle begins between 48 hours to five days of injecting. It lasts clinically for at least five to eight weeks. The recovery of the muscle function takes between five to 14 weeks, depending upon the density of the innovation, the injection site, the amount and concentration of botulinum toxin injected. The process of functional recovery occurs by sprouting of nerve fibers from the terminal axons and extrajunctional acetylcholine receptors. So finally, the recovery does occur. That is why uh, the, the effect of botulinum basically lasts for about five to eight weeks. So what is the mechanism of action of botulinum toxin? It causes a recession effect of the injected extraocular muscle and the lengthening of the paralyzed muscle by contraction and the contraction of its agonist. This, 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 is, this is a theory, but uh, this is the main effect. The recession effect is the main effect and the lengthening of the paralyzed muscle may occur as well as the contraction of the uh, agonist. There are seven known serotypes of botulinum toxin, uh, A to G, and they differ in the protein cleavage site. As I mentioned earlier, the protein uh, cleavage occurs and prevents the release of acetylcholine. These are the commercially available botulinum toxin A. We have Botox, Dysport, and Xeomin. Botox is what we use in India. This is on our botulinum toxin A. Uh, this is by Alagan. And uh, it usually comes in a vial of 50 or 100 units. And uh, this port, uh, uh, Botox and Xeomin uh, are equivalent in uh, uh, the efficacy, whereas uh, three to five units of this port is equivalent to one unit of Botox. A lot of countries do use this port. Uh, in, uh, so you just basically have to modify the dose according to which, uh, uh, which uh, commercial uh, botulinum you're using. So dosing is in units. One unit corresponds to the quantity of toxin which is lethal in 50% of the female rats with Webster when injected peritonally. This is, this is how they have uh, uh, made the uh, unit dosing. 
The lethal qu quantity for a 70 kilo man is 5,000 units. That is 50 bottles of botulinum toxin. Uh, so in strabismus, this is this is a very high dose. So uh, chances of uh, it, it is certainly not lethal uh, injecting uh, uh, botulinum toxin for strabismus. Uh, the antidote is available that blocks the effect of botulinum toxin if injected within 30 minutes, if at all required. This is stored dry and reconstituted with balanced salt solution 0.9% NaCl. This does require a, uh, require a cold storage. Uh, we need to store it uh, in the refrigerator on the, uh, on the side door or on the bottom shelf. Uh, so th that uh, temperature needs to be maintained. Normally, the, the instructions given by the company are that it should be used uh, within six hours of uh, reconstitution. But practically, uh, uh, we use, we share the vial with multiple patients and we do store the vial uh, uh, in most uh, uh, hospitals or most conditions for, for a month. After a month is what we discard it. So it, and it does, uh, the, the, uh, the longer the time, uh, the less is the effect of the botulinum, but uh, it does, it is effective till about one month, but it's very important to maintain the cold storage. So uh, depending on the vial, whether if it's a 50 unit vial or a hundred unit or a 200 vial, uh, the, 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 the dilutant, you, you have to uh, dilute it uh, with, normally in strabismus, we use 2.5 units or five units to inject in the muscle. So if it's a 50 unit vial, you need two ml to make it 2.5 units. And if it's a hundred uh, uh, unit vial, we need uh, four ml to make it 2.5 units. So this chart usually does come uh, with the uh, uh, Botox, uh, uh, the, uh, the bottle. So you can always look it up and make it, but it's very important to uh, make uh, reconstitute in the right dose so that you know how much dose we are injecting into the muscle. So 2.5 units to five units is the average dose which is injected into the extracular muscle to treat uh, strabismus. Uh, in certain conditions, lesser doses uh, required, for example, for superior rectus, lesser dose because uh, it can cause, it may go into the, in the levator and cause doses. So lesser dose is required in superior rectus. And in cases of, if you're using it in uh, fibrosis, a, a higher dose of about 10 units may be required, but the average dose is about 2.5 units to five units. We uh, can inject uh, botulinum toxin, Botox in topical anesthesia or general anesthesia may be used for children or non-cooperative adults. So uh, the technique uh, used is the speculum is applied. Normally we stand on the side of the eye in which we are injecting. We ask the patient to look away from the muscle to be injected. For example, if we, are inject if we want to inject in medial rectus, we ask the patient to look towards, uh, to uh, abduct the eye to look towards us. And uh, uh, if you're doing it under GA, we can even placate the canthus with forceps and hold the muscle or rotate the eye away from the muscle to be injected. We introduce the needle tangentially through the bulbar conjunctiva. Uh, the needle used may be 27 gauge or 30 gauge. This is, this is when we do it without the EMG. For uh, horizontal mus uh, muscles, when the approach is uh, quite uh, clean, so uh, EMG is not essential. Uh, we can do it without the EMG as well. Uh, if you're doing it in the microscope, it's even easier because you can see the uh, muscle fibers through the conjunctiva. Uh, sometimes dissection of the conjunctiva allowing di direct approach to the muscle is may be used. That's another alternative. Oh. Uh, sorry. sorry. The EMG, of course, uh, the most uh, popular method is the EMG. But uh, 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 as I said, it's not required in all cases, especially for horizontal muscles. Uh, the AMG, if you're using it, the electrodes are applied to the forehead. And uh, we ask the patient to look in the opposite direction of the action of the muscle to introduce the needle into the muscle. And then we ask the patient to look towards the muscle to be injected. And the needle is advanced verticalized at the loudest sound. When you hear the loudest sound, that means that we are into the muscle. These are some of the pictures that I have taken from the internet, as you can see uh, in, on the right side. Uh, this is the, the this is the sound uh, that you hear when you are into the muscle. 
Um, here we've uh, put the electrodes on the forehead. First, we ask the uh, patient to look in the direction, uh, in the opposite direction, and then in the direction of the uh, acting muscle and uh, till we hear the sound, then we inject the Botox. So the effect of uh, Botox may start uh, in two to seven days. And we, we uh, follow up at three weeks for to see the effect. The maximum effect may be seen at around three weeks. And uh, then we follow up at four to eight months for if uh, to see the effect again. And if required, a re-injection may be done. Then we look at the complications that may occur uh, with the Botox. So the most uh, important or the most common thing is toxin diffusion or inadvertent weakening of the adjacent muscles. Uh, so especially uh, going to the levator, so temporary ptosis is what you can uh, uh, occur in 12% adults and 25% children. As you can see in this uh, picture, uh, this child had esotropia, uh, was injected uh, in both medial rectus, uh, Botox was injected, and you can see there is an exotropia and a ptosis of the right eye. Um, but this, uh, this is at uh, one week, and this resolved uh, eventually, and this, is, this picture is at two months when the child is ortho. So it does, the process is temporary, it does resolve. Uh, there could be an overcorrection of strabismus, there could be diplopia, uh, subconjunctival hemorrhage, depending on the technique that you have used, and a transient vertical deviation in 17% of the patients. So whenever, whenever you're injecting uh, uh, Botox, uh, we ask the patient not to lie down for at least 12 hours. I mean, we ask the patient to be in sitting position or walking or standing uh, so to, to prevent the, uh, uh, you know, the diffusion of the Botox to levator. This is what uh, we can tell the patient to avoid uh, getting ptosis. The rare complications are retrobulbar hemorrhage, perforations. Sometimes they can be pupillary abnormalities due to damage of the ciliary ganglion if you are doing a retrobulbar injection, or sometimes the uh, Botox can even uh, uh, diffuse into the anterior chamber causing sphincter uh, paralysis. There could be a transient decrease in accommodation as well. So what are the contradic uh, contradictions? Where do we not use Botox? Uh, we don't use it in neuromuscular disorders like myasthenia gravis or Eton Lambert syndrome. We do not use it in pregnancy and lactation. It is a category C drug. Uh, it is secreted in breast milk, though it is uncertain whether it is or not. And it is usually not, it does not cross placenta being a high molecular weight protein, but still uh, it is contraindicated in pregnancy and lactation. And uh, as with most other treatments for squint, uh, the unrealistic expectations, you always have to uh, uh, inform the patient about uh, uh, the possible overcorrections, undercorrections, complications, and uh, accordingly uh, give Botox. Uh, these, I'm just listing, now this, this, this comes as the most important slide, I'm listing the indications of when Botox is given in strabismus, or when it, these are the indications in which Botox can be used in strabismus. So if you have an esotropia or exotropia with small angle deviation of less than 40 pd, these, this is uh, an indication. So you have to stress upon small angle deviation that is less than 40 pd. If there is an acute onset comitant esotropia or uh, acute paralytic strabismus, post-operative residual or conjunctive uh, strabismus, active thyroid disease, or uh, as an adjunct to surgery in large angle esotropia or large angle exotropia or six nerve palsy, or as a muscle sparing option in patients at risk of anterior segment ischemia. I shall be going uh, 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 across all these in my later slides, but these are the main indications one has to remember. Uh, Botox is least effective if it is used alone in large deviations more than 40 PD. Uh, or if it is uh, used in restrictive or mechanical strabismus. Uh, saying that I've, in my previous uh, slide, I, uh, I have uh, mentioned the use in thyroid eye disease, but uh, uh, again, I'll tell in the later uh, slides that in the thyroid, it should be used in the acute phase to reduce the inflammation and not in the truly restrictive phase. Uh, then secondary strabismus due to large muscle resections or muscle slip slippage when you can't find the muscle, or if it is a large resection, there is no use using Botox, or it is, so it is not used in alphabetical patterns like A, V, X, 
not used in DVDs, and it is not used in chronic paralytic strabismus. So what are the conditions with favorable outcomes? Uh, congenital esotropias, although uh, congenital esotropias may be large angle esotropias, the outcome actually, a uh, uh, favorable outcome is more for non-accommodative esotropias. Uh, for accommodative esotropias, we give glasses. For congenital esotropia, if they are large angle, uh, the favor you may, the multiple injections may be required, uh, but non-accommodative accommodative esotropias respond uh, very well to Botox. Uh, acute onset of esotropia in infancy or childhood or adults, we can the outcome is good. Or if it is a decompensated esotropia in adults, the outcome is good. Uh, children with psychomotor delay, cerebral palsy, and unstable angles is where uh, Botox is specially indicated, uh, you know, stressing upon unstable angles where you can't uh, do a surgery due to the, uh, uh, the neurological condition of the child and you're unable to measure the angles, the angles are changing. So uh, these children may benefit with Botox. So again, uh, stressing that uh, the uh, Botox gives favorable outcomes in small to moderate deviations in pediatric patients. Bilateral injections are better than unilateral and uh, also stressing upon this potential of binocularity. Uh, uh, if there is pot potential of binocularity, uh, the uh, the uh, only a single injection or less less number of injections may be required to maintain ortho position. So, uh, step by step, again uh, going towards individual strabismus, you go to comitant strabismus. So again, stressing small to moderate preoperative angle, less than thirty to thirty up to 30 to 35, less than 40 PD. The success, uh, success rate is 76%. Uh, for large angles, combined surgery and uh, Botox may be favorable. Uh, in children, the timing of the injection, they say that uh, in especially talking about congenital esotropia, less than six months uh, is not, uh, it doesn't matter if you give it later than six months. Six months to 24 months of age is a, is a favorable time for injection in uh, uh, children with the congenital esotropias. Uh, here you can see a picture uh, with the left esotropia. And uh, after giving Botox, uh, there was initially an exotropia overcorrection. And after two months, the patient is ortho. In intermittent exotropias, uh, young patients with poorly controlled intermittent exotropias, uh, Botox may be, may be given to delay surgery. The success rate is 50% to 70% with bilateral lateral rectus injections. Uh, but for the success rate for angles more than 35 to 40 BD is much lesser and surgery is preferred. Saying that uh, the effect in intermittent exotropia is not as good as in esotropias. Another uh, condition where Botox is used is in conversions insufficiency. It may achieve an early improvement of 80%, but uh, it again goes back, uh, the patient may go back to uh, symptoms after three months or later. So here also, it is not, effic not very efficacious. In cyclic uh, esotropia, uh, usually there's a 48-hour cycle with 24 hours of orthotropia and 24 hours of manifest esotropia. Here, the patients do uh, respond well to Botox. It is the first line of treatment. Uh, surgery may overcorrect, but Botox uh, usually does, uh, it is the first line of treatment and may resolve the cyclical, break the cycle. Uh, for conversion spasm or spasm of near reflex, that is excessive accommodation meiosis with the near work or there's a dystonia. This is also responsive to Botox, but again, may return to baseline once the effect wears off. Then you come to paralytic strabismus. It is given in acute phases of extraocular nerve paralysis in adults. In children, it is not really favored, but uh, preferred only in adults. It does give symptomatic relief. It relieves the patient of uh, diplopia. It reduces the recovery period. It diminishes the action of the antagonist muscle. And it is most commonly used in six nerve palsy. In six nerve palsy, due to tumor or trauma with a large deviation, Botox is recommended within one month of paralysis. Whereas uh, if it is due to microvascular etiology, it is recommended after one month of 
the uh, paralysis. This is because uh, uh, it is anticipated that the microvascular uh, etiology uh, may resolve on its own. Uh, so they, they, it's a, it's a nearly an uh, equal result that uh, uh, it resolving on its own versus giving Botox is nearly equal. In fourth nerve or acute third nerve, it may or may not be given. It is really in fourth nerve paralysis, giving it into inferior oblique uh, may or may not be beneficial depending if, you've, uh, uh, give, if you're able to give it in the uh, inferior oblique muscle. Uh, it may cause uh, also, it may cause hypertropia and overcorrection. So it's it's not uh, the ideal thing to give in the fourth uh, nerve and an acute third nerve only uh, sometimes in the lateral rectus to relieve uh, diphthopia. It is certainly avoided in chronic nerve palsies. For residual or consecutive deviations, yes, it is recommended uh, between two to eight weeks after surgery. Uh, ideally, if given within the first week of surgery, it is most beneficial, but the recommended use is between two to eight weeks. Uh, it may be used in residual or consecutive esotropia. It is most beneficial in esotropias less than 30 PD or small exotropias. So this is a uh, slide which I've taken from the internet. Here in this, in the first slide, you see a left hypertropia. In this, there was a, a left inferior oblique uh, recession was combined with superior rectus adjustable re recession. So this patient, from being left hyper went down to left hypo of 18 PD. So there was a uh, consecutive or uh, uh, hypertropia of the left eye. So in this patient, uh, Botox was injected in the inferior rectus and eventually uh, after a few months became ortho. So this is a consecutive uh, strabismus in which the Botox helped. Restrictive strabismus is not uh, an actual uh, uh, indication. Uh, it is less uh, responsive to Botox. In thyroid associated biotopathy, it's usually used in the lids, but uh, for strabismus, it is more effective if it is injected early to relax the inflammatory spasm. And uh, it doesn't work when once the fibrosis has uh, set in. A higher dose, up to 10 units may be required and more frequent injections may be required. This can also be tried in high myopia or secondary to retinal surgery, but it doesn't, it is not so effective. It may be used as a diagnostic tool. So to see if, uh, to detect if fusion is present preoperatively, you can give Botox initially to see whether the patient will be able to fuse or not. And then you can plan your surgery. It also uh, helps in the prediction of the surgical results for incompetent deviations. And as you can see, to detect a lo lost muscle, so you can see in this uh, uh, picture that uh, uh, there's a lost uh, extracular muscle on the left side. You, uh, the unopposed uh, muscle is, uh, is a contracture. If Botox is uh, given in the uh, antagonist, uh, the globe moves back and the lost muscle comes from uh, uh, more anteriorly and you may be able to uh, find it more easily. So it can be used to detect a lost muscle as well. For congenital nystagmus, it, uh, it is a question mark. Uh, it do not uh, all the uh, studies that have been done uh, are equivocal. It can be injected retrobarbital uh, five to 10 units, but uh, we do not know how much, uh, whether it is really efficacious or not. In a, and uh, in the uh, patent strabismus, it is not recommended. In DVD, it is not recommended. So a lot of uh, uh, clinical guidelines and uh, recommendations have been made by uh, the following uh, societies, the Spanish Society of Strabismus and Pediatric Ophthalmology, American Academy, and the European Board of Ophthalmology Subcommittee. This is based on uh, the... Um, reviews and studies, also Cochrane review and studies which have been conducted in the past. Uh, the fallacy of this is that uh, most of the studies are uh, retrospective or, or case reports, but uh, anyhow, the guidelines have been uh, formed. And uh, to summarize uh, the guidelines, 
it, it says which in which conditions there's a strong recommendation or, or, or weak recommendation. So in congenital esotropia, less than six months of age, there's a strong recommendation for using Botox. In acute cranial nerve paralysis of adults, there's a strong recommendation, especially the sixth nerve. Acquired esotropia of infancy is moderate. Decompensated congenital esotropia of adults is a weak recommendation. Infantile exotropia is a weak recommendation. Infantile third, fourth, sixth cranial nerve palsy is a weak recommendation. I say these are, this is an infantile, not adult. It's an infantile. Whereas in acute cranial nerve of adult, there's a strong recommendation. In congenital nystagmus, there is no recommendation. So to conclude, um, so why is it uh, uh, sometimes preferred or uh, in, can be con given in conditions uh, where you don't want to do a surgery because it's a shorter procedure duration? It has a lower cost. Lower cost saying that uh, when you share the vial with multiple patients, there is a lower exposure to general anesthesia, uh, but more extensive trials are needed. Saying that, uh, uh, going through the studies and uh, the average, uh, the, the number of times the uh, uh, Botox injection is uh, repeated is uh, about 25 to 50 times in a single patient. Uh, so uh, I do not know whether that's an ideal thing to do, to repeat the Botox injection so many times, uh, uh, 25 to 50 seems a very high number. So thank you for your patient hearing. And a special acknowledgement to uh, Dr. Pyle, she was a consultant in I care for helping me prepare the slides. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for uh, that crisp talk. You actually uh, left a lot of time for questions and discussion. So that's always good. And uh, Pradeep, sir, any comments from you, remarks from you before we go on to our questions? I think it's a very interesting talk from Dr. Renu, who has done a lot of Botox injections. Uh, personally, I have always been a little wary of using Botox because I feel it is uh, less predictable than surgery. Uh, although the time required under anesthesia is less, but as she said in the last part of her talk, that the multiple injections may be required. Uh, I had a personal experience with uh, 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 during my fellowship in 2001, with Dr. Keith McNear at um, uh, Richmond Eye Hospital, Richmond, uh, Virginia. Uh, Dr. Keith McNear has done a uh, lot of work on using uh, the Botox injections, both in infantile esotropias and infantile exotropias. Uh, his articles are there. Uh, what I saw uh, in my, during my posting, I mean, uh, that's what I interacted with him too, that they had to do repeat injections in his... Uh, published thing also he has said 3.1 or something per patient uh, is the uh, injections he required and he used to do under ethrin anesthesia um, using emg of course and uh, because of that that you have to use in the initial part only the uh, before the sound gets abolished because of anesthesia you have to be uh, doing it so it's a shorter procedure undoubtedly but because of the repeatability that is required uh, personally, I have felt that in children, particularly when we are more at, uh, concerned about the uh, alignment and not just surgery or any procedure, we are more concerned that we should achieve binocular alignment. So I would be a little more concerned about using it for infantile esotropia. Uh, I have mostly used botulinum toxin for uh, in adults, paralytic strabismus, um, in the non-ischemic variety. Uh, once I've seen that they are not recovering. So mostly the, as Dr. Renu mentioned, that the cases which have a compressive or a tumor pathology, which are not recovering um, beyond a month, then I have used it to expedite the recovery in the meantime that they are waiting. And nothing is lost because we would have to otherwise wait for six months in these cases before we do a surgery. So that is the only indication which I generally uh, recommend. We may use it for uh, also a situation when we have to do the third muscle. So when we are doing a vertical rectus transpositioning in a person whom the third rectus muscle would be a uh, little risky to do uh, for the risk of anti-segment ischemia, then one may inject Botox in the, in the opposite muscle to uh, get the effect and get the in, uh, transient phase in which it will be effective 
there would be the transposition which will uh, have the effect and then it may last for longer time. So that is probably my take on using Botox. In nystagmus, of course, as she mentioned, there is no role of uh, botulinum toxin. Uh, same is true for thyroid eye disease, only uh, cases in which there is no fibrosis that can be, uh, I think, used. So we can probably have uh, questions. Yes, sir. Uh, so the first one is, how do we decide on titration of botulinum toxin based on amount of ocular deviation to be corrected? So it is not like the surgery where everything is uh, measured uh, uh, from degrees to millimeters of recession or resection. Uh, uh, there's an average, uh, uh, the amount of de deviation, if it is a uh, uh, less than say 20, you can give, depends which muscle you're injecting and the uh, average is between 2.5 to 5. So uh, it's a case to case thing. It's, it's not uh, specific like the recession or resections. You have to decide and uh, repetition may be required. Normally we give 2.5 standard dose uh, in whichever muscle we are using normally. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what are the differences between the reconstitution of Dysport from Botox and Zeomin? Just about the reconstitution, ma'am, if you can quickly revise that. Uh, so the reconstitution is, this. it depends uh, uh, on the how many units the vial has. The reconstitution will make it, uh, suppose, uh, 2.5 ml, uh, 2.5 units for 0.1 ml but the amount used for Dysport will be much higher because three to five units of Dysport is equivalent to one unit of Botox. So if you're using uh, 2.5 units of Botox in a patient, you might uh, need three times that of Dysport. Mm. The, the reconstitution is similar. Mm. That depends on how much the vial has. So the, the, each of the vial has a, uh, you know, it has instructions of how much you need to use to reconstitute it. But the amount of the units that you're using for the sport is much higher than Botox. Okay. Uh, and how do we counsel a patient about the com common complications encountered post-procedure and the need for multiple doses? So... As you go along, you do learn to talk to the patients about everything before you, uh, you know, treat them, especially when children are involved. Uh, the parents are very anxious. So you always have to list the complications and the effects. Uh, we do always tell about doses, but we do, uh, you know, sort of assure that it is temporary. Mm -hmm. Overcorrections may also be temporary. Need for re-injections also may be required. These are told to the patients, but these are, these are the Botox is not in where we are, of course, always the option is given that surgery, surgical option, wherever it is, uh, needs to be done is always told. Mm -hmm. so you're giving uh, Botox for a certain reason where, for example, you are enabled, for example, if it's a special child, the child has, a, has CP, even the parents know and uh, a lot of these uh, uh, children already have uh, would have been receiving Botox for uh, deformities and the spasticity in the legs or the hands. So they know the effect of Botox that it is temporary. So in these patients, it is not, it, it is, they understand. And uh, for where, if, if somebody doesn't want to do uh, surgery at all, he would also understand that this, we always say, say that uh, surgery may be preferred because Botox is temporary. So we do explain, it has to be explained. Mm -hmm. Sir, any tips from you? Uh, I think what she said is right. Okay. Basically, we have to counsel with the patient and uh, only if he's uh, consenting with this uh, thing, then we would be trying it in children. The interesting part was that Dr. Keith McNair had uh, done a study on the uh, special type of extraocular muscles that are there in the infants. So along with Spencer, who was his uh, uh, co-author and he was basically an anat anatomist, so they had done the biopsy of these children and they have uh, con uh, confirmed that the infantile medial rectus is different than what we have in adult extraocular muscles. And uh, the uh, effect lasts longer, according to him, in infants. So that is probably the reason that some of the people who are more uh, keen to inject in uh, the Botox, they would prefer that, okay, in infantile isotropes of smaller deviations 
they may be finding more success. Uh, his, uh, uh, I mean, statement was that the effect is more lasting in infantile esotropia compared to adult uh, cases in which the effect is definitely transitory and the effect goes away after three months. So that has to be kept in mind. Uh, the other thing is that because it may also cause ptosis, uh, that's why my fear for using in children is there, that we do not want ptosis also to happen. And the other part is that uh, in his published results, it's been shown that those cases in which ortho was achieved were the ones who had initially a overcorrection of about 15 to 20 prisms of exotropia in infantile isotropes. So you would have to have an overcorrection initially to get an orthotropic thing. That is one thing very particular. The effect doesn't come immediately also. That's another issue. It will take about three to five days for the effect to come. So initially, you may not get the result. So all these are the reasons that I have always been more uh, in favor of doing a surgery, which gives us more definite results. Uh, the time taken is not very much for surgery. I think it may be just uh, a little more than uh, the Botox injections. The main time is general anesthesia in children. <laughs> so anesthesia usually takes more time than the surgery I have seen. So I would say that I would rather uh, in children, smaller children, uh, less than a year, I would prefer to do a surgery if I'm doing. Uh, in adults, even if you have a ptosis, is not a problem because these are paralytic strabismus, they have diplopia and they don't mind having a ptosis for some time which uh, prevents diplopia for that period. So they are happy otherwise also. So I think Botox, my favor is for using it for maybe six nerve palsies in adults in which uh, ischemic variety has been ruled out. And uh, what should be our follow-up protocols in these patients, ma'am? Like when we give, give a Botox, how frequently should we follow? So normally, uh, first week, three weeks, and then four months. Yeah. First week, because they, you have to look for complications like doses or yeah. overcorrections, three weeks to get an ideal sort of result that you're looking for, whether you're being able to achieve or not. Yeah. And four, four months to see whether the effect is waning off. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in comitant deviations, does the amount of Botox to be injected differ between dominant and non-dominant eye? Uh, uh, from the uh, published papers, yes, uh, uh, it does. Uh, in, in a non-dominant eye, you need to give more. But practically, uh, it is divided uh, equally in both the eyes. Mm -hmm. So if whatever... Uh, uh, if, Whenever I use it, I use I equally divide it in both the eyes. But yes, it has been published that uh, the, uh, the non-dominant eye may require more. That's for committed or incommitted? Even for committed. Usually, but for committed, it's an equal dose is given usually. Practically, an equal dose is given. So I think we give both the eyes. Yeah. For incommitted, yes. That may be because of the contracture, chances are more in the... So you can have... Uh, more contraction in the ipsilateral antagonist. So that may be the reason that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then the next one is, ma'am, uh, in a paralytical uh, form of strabismus, is there a uh, time period before which Botox needs to be injected for achieving maximum possible ocular al alignment? Paralytic form. Say that again. Is there a time? Uh, in paralytic form of strabismus, is there a time period before which Botox needs to be injected for achieving maximal uh, possible ocular alignment? So, I said in, in ischemic, uh, it usually recovers on its own. So, we wait it out. If it's a, a tumor or a compressive lesion, uh, we, need, we can give it within a month. Mm -hmm. So there is no, it's not, uh, but we just, it's uh, comparing a, a compressive lesion to ischemic lesion. Uh, we wait longer in ischemic lesion because we hope that it is going to recover on its own. Uh, whereas in the uh, compressive lesions, you give it earlier. Say so usually there's the, in, in a month, we can give it in a compressive lesion. In a, a ischemic, we can give it after a month. Okay. Is there any comments from you? Yeah, I think that's right. That basically okay. we are doing. We just need to ensure the diagnosis first. That what's the cause? Because in ischemic, you may have a lot of success credited to Botox, which may be uh, on its own. <laughs> yes. 
So the next one is uh, last couple of ones left. What are the factors uh, likely to contribute for a favorable outcome while being considered uh, for a Botox injection? Like when, in which case will it be more? So potential to binocularity is, uh, is the, I think, the most favorable outcome. If, uh, I mean, uh, it's a long-standing uh, uh, squint and uh, uh, amblyopia or uh, sensory, uh, if, it's, if it's an amblyopic eye and long-standing potential, if the potential to binocularity is less, then the outcome is less favorable even for committant strabismus. Whereas if the if it's uh, an intermittent or for esotropias, it is, if, if done early, uh, it has a more favorable outcome. So potential for binocularity, I think, is an important, uh, uh, you know, sort of condition. Any other factors, so? Yeah, I think that's right. Basically, uh, what she said is correct. Like for cosmetic uh, uh, conditions, uh, most of the times if uh, you're giving Botox, so you have to give it multiple times, many, many times for cosmetic because the effect uh, when it wanes off, it again goes back. Although every time the eye goes back, it may uh, be less deviated from the first time, but the deviation occurs. Whereas uh, if the, if the uh, patient is able to maintain uh, binocular uh, vision, then the chances of deviation are less. The basic reason is that if there is a fusion, uh, yeah. even if there is a little bit of uh, residual or uh, uh, overcorrection, it may be taken care of by the fusion itself. So if you mm -hmm. have an exophoria, the fusion will take over that part. So that's the reason that binocular vision people would have a better uh, results compared to the ones which are for cosmetic reasons in which there is no uh, fusion possibility. So I think that's the reason that it works better in this is with fusional ability. Hmm. Okay. Um, the next one is what could possibly explain if an acquired hypertropia is in a patient receiving Botox uh, uh, for a horizontal deviation? Reason for acquired hypertropia. So the, the Botox percolates when you inject it. Hmm. It percolates. A lot of times uh, it... Uh, when you're giving it, especially without the EMG, uh, it may go uh, subtenons, may even go subconjunctival, and it may percolate to the vertical muscles. So depending where it has percolated, you may get a hyper or hy hyper. So same very used in every case. No, EMG guided Botox. No, it is not. Uh, uh, so horizontal muscles are uh, uh, easy access. So it's not essential uh, to have an EMG machine if you're, uh, after a while, all strabismus surgeons are, uh, they can visualize the uh, muscles, uh, you know, quite, uh, they know how to visualize the muscles and especially if you're doing it under the microscope. Uh, so access to the horizontal muscles is not uh, impossible or not that difficult. So EMG machine is not essential. So it's not required in all cases. Only if, if, if the muscle has been, say, suppose, recessed and you're unable to visualize it and you have to put the needle much further away, you do not know if you're doing a blind procedure, it's better to have an EMG to know that you're injecting it if, if it's the muscle is far back. So you know, if it's, for example, in a recessed muscle, then maybe EMG is important. Otherwise, not. The important part is that you have to do intramuscular injection, not in the tendinous part. So you have to go a uh, little, uh, uh, almost like four to five millimeters away from the insertion site, uh, yeah. even in a normal muscle. So as Dr. Enu is saying, in those cases in which already recession has been done, it may be a little more difficult to uh, ensure that you are in the muscle itself. And the second part, which she said that you have to ensure that it remains in the sheath. Uh, if it is uh, injected more than the required amount, then it will definitely uh, perfuse out. And that is what causes the uh, ptosis or uh, in vertical incompetence. Yeah. And um, I'm the last question for the day is, uh, any uh, vision threatening complications that we should be wary of before uh, injecting Botox? Is there any vision threatening complication that can, that can happen if you are injecting Botox? You can cause a perforation. <laughs> yeah, that is there. Yeah. Yes. You can cause a perforation. So 
that is of course certainly you know something that you need to be careful, very careful about you have to know where you're injecting you cannot afford to cause a perforation mm. and the other thing is end of thymitis yes so yeah. if you're using like reusing the same then you have to be very very careful that the risk of infection would be introduced yes that's another thing so i think sir with that we have wrapped up for the day uh, any remarks from you uh, for the talk today i think it was quite interesting yeah. with all the questions also being answered like in detail so i think it is an interesting topic because botox has always been a subject which has always aroused a lot of questions uh, it's interesting that it was introduced 40 years back more than 40, now 41 years back by uh, Alan Scott. Hmm. Uh, Alan Scott. And hmm. the interesting part is he is left using it for strabismus. So this is one condition in which the off-label use of Botox is much more than the uh, indicated use. It was meant for strabismus, but now yeah. the Botox world over is used more by the dermatologists and the cosmetologists than by the strabismologists. Yes. So I think the off-label use is much more than what. So that's the interesting part. So it's a very interesting subject, use of Botox in strabismus. It came as a uh, real uh, innovation. By, I think he was awarded for that uh, in the conference uh, because it was something like if non-surgical it would work, uh, then it would be a, a great advantage. But unfortunately, because of its unpredictability, it has not been able to convince uh, most strabismologists who are um, getting more definite results with their surgical uh, wow. Corrections. So Botox, yes, is having a small niche in cases in which you are waiting for surgery or in which you have to do a third muscle or uh, so those cases, yes, you can definitely use Botox. So it was a very interesting subject and very nicely covered by Dr. Renu, who has a lot of experience on her own personally. So I would like to thank her and of course, thank Shefali for conducting it, anchoring it so nicely in making it more interesting. So with the questions that were there. So, and thanks for the uh, lively audience that we had. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, uh, we'll meet on October 14th and the topic is step-by-step -step strabismus. Uh, that is uh, choice of surgery, dosing, basic surgeries by Dr. Jyoti Metalia. So see you all on uh, October 14th. All right. Good night and take care, everyone. Good night and thank you very much again.